I think many people would admit that the Iran agreement had some deficiencies. One of the largest deficiencies might have been that the $100 billion was released uh, all at once instead of maybe gradually to help modulate behavior over a longer period of time. That being said, the $100 billion that was released uh, was a great inducement to get Iran to sign the agreement. Uh, that was a carrot, and that carrot's gone. They've gotten the good thing, and now we want uh, compliance, and now we're pulling out. And so the question is, you know, what are the next inducements to get them to sign things, or will there not be? I think there's a question with um, – there are two possibilities, basically, of what will happen. So you reintroduce the strongest sanctions ever. Uh, they either don't work – that's one possibility, because they're unilateral, and some say unilateral sanctions won't work. Let's say they don't work. That means Europe, China, and Russia continue to trade with them. And Iran says, well, they're going to continue to trade with us. We'll just keep abiding by the agreement. They don't develop any more nuclear weapons or technology towards that. But they don't do anything else that you would like, ballistic missiles, less terrorism. So really, basically, we don't get what we want if the sanctions don't work. Second possibility, let's say the sanctions do work. Uh, we have enough manipulation of money that flows through us from Europe. Europe does a lot of trade with us. Europe buckles. Europe buckles. I think Russia and China still will trade with them. But let's say Europe buckles. And let's say it works and it puts enough pressure on Iran. Then there are two possibilities of what Iran does. First possibility is they say, oh, Secretary Pompeo, we love Secretary Pompeo's 12-point strategy, and we're going to accept that. I think that's unlikely. The second possibility, if the sanctions work and they put enough pressure on them, Iran feels the pressure, is that they restart their nuclear centrifuge program. So those are two possibilities. But what I'd like to do is go through the 12 steps that you'd like Iran to do and sort of explore what these would mean if we thought about them in terms bigger than Iran. So one of your first things is, and this was, came up during JPOH, but nobody really could really get this done. Mil they, you want Iran to reveal the military dimensions of its nuclear program. Well, let's substitute uh, Israel for Iran there. Mm -hmm. Does anybody think Israel is going to reveal the military dimensions of their nuclear program? Well, you'll say, well, they're our friend. Well, yeah, but from Iran's perspective, they say they see Israel as a rival and a regional rival. Let's put Saudi Arabia in there. Will Saudi Arabia reveal the military dimensions of its nuclear program? Well, some might say, hmm, they don't really have it. But I'm guessing there are files over at the CIA that say, well, you know what, they have talked to people about purchasing it. Some say they have purchased nuclear technology. I guarantee we know that, and you probably can't admit it, but let's put Saudi Arabia in there. Are they willing to discuss anything they've done to develop nuclear weapons? So really what you're asking for is something that they are never going to agree to. Okay? You can try to cripple them. It's sort of like unconditional surrender. You're not getting that. Let's move on. Proliferation of ballistic missiles. I don't like them threatening surrounding countries or us with ballistic missiles. Nobody does. But they respond not just to us. They respond to Saudi Arabia. There's a thousand-year-old war over there. There's a thousand-year-old religious war over there. And there's hostility between the two. So when we supply weapons... When the Saudis buy ballistic missiles, the Saudis have a ballistic missile program, they respond to that. The Saudis and their allies, the Gulf Sheikdoms, spend eight times more than Iran. So when you tell Iran, oh, well, you have to give up your ballistic missile program, but you don't say anything to the Saudis, you think they're ever going to sign that? They would have to be crippled and starving people in the streets for them ever to agree to give up their ballistic missile program. Had we kept the Iran agreement with them, and you said to the Iranians, well, we want less of an arms race over there. We'd like to have peace with Saudi Arabia. Could we get Saudi Arabia to the table with Iran to, to discuss either a freeze of ballistic missiles? You know, when we went to Russia, we didn't just succumb and say we'd give up our weapons. Neither did Russia. We, we did, it, did it in parity. We had an agreement. If you leave Saudi Arabia out of it and you leave Israel out of it and you look at Iran in isolation, that's not the way they perceive it. So I th don't think they're going to jump at your 12 notions here Senator, of what you'd like Senator, them to do. Senator, may I just may, may make this one Go point? Ahead. Um, I, I think the example of Saudi Arabia is a, a reasonable one. Uh, we have told the Saudis exactly what I asked from the Iranians. To talk about their, their nuclear program? We, we have, they, they have said they want a peaceful, nu peaceful nuclear energy program, and we have told them we want a gold standard Section 123 agreement from them, which would not permit them to enrich. That is simply all I've asked of Iran as do, well. Do we have information that the Saudis have talked to actors in Pakistan and other places about purchasing nuclear technology? 
Uh, I, I can't answer that here this morning. Which is, which is to say no, we probably in all likelihood do have that information. And so the thing is, it's a one-way playing field. Unless we understand that there are two big players over there, really three big players. You got Iran, you got Israel, and you got Saudi Arabia. We want Iran to do things we're not willing to ask anybody else to do and that we would never do. Senator, so, I, I, I disagree with you. I think we ask most nations to do precisely what we're asking Iran Let's to do. move on to another one of your 12 points uh, and the military support for the Houthi rebels. Well, once again, you're asking them to end it, but you're not asking the Saudis to end their bombardment of Yemen. I mean, if you look at the humanitarian disaster that is Yemen, it is squarely on the shoulders of the Saudis. And so we're going to ask the Iranians to quit supplying, and they, in all likelihood, are the ones supplying the missiles. And you, we get reports, and the Defense Department comes and says there have been a, you know, 32 missile strikes in Saudi Arabia. Well, there's been like 16,000 bombings of Yemen by Saudi Arabia. Nobody even mentions that. We act as if it didn't even happen. If we are so ignorant that there are two sides to this war, uh, we're never getting anywhere. Iran's not going to stop doing that, but they might if you sat them down with the Saudi Arabia and said this arms race doesn't make sense, and Saudi Arabia is willing to sit down at the table. You know, is Saudi Arabia willing to stop, in other words, withdraw all forces under Iran's command throughout the entire of Syri entirety of Syria? There were dozens of, of groups in there, even ISIS, that were getting weapons from Qatar and Saudi Arabia. In fact, one of the leaked emails from WikiLeaks was, uh, from Podesta to, uh, from Clinton to Podesta, saying, my goodness, we've got to stop Saudi Arabia and Qatar from funding ISIS. That's a direct email. They were acknowledging they knew about it, and they were acknowledging it was a problem, but weapons were flowing into all kinds of radicals in there. So if you want Iran to stop, and I mean, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are 10 times the problem. You know, the whole Syrian war has all of these radical jihadists. The people who attacked us came from Saudi Arabia. We ignore all that and we lavish them with more bombs. So really, until we acknowledge there are two sides to the war or three sides to the war in the Middle East, you're not going to get the agreement. I think it was naive to pull out of the Iran agreement, and I think in the end we'll be worse off for it.